Hello, I'm Renee Floor, and I've been the owner operator for five years of America's finest crime scene cleaning company. Hey guys, this is Michael. I've been working with Renee for coming on three years now, a year as his general manager, and loving the experiences that every day brings us in this industry. Hi, my name is Holly Taylor, and I've been in the hazmat industry for five years, and I'm finally ready to share my journey with you. And I'm Sam. I'm a videographer and sound engineer, and I've been working with Renee for about a year now. So what we today call hoarding was once referred to as Collier syndrome, which was named for two brothers, Langley and Homer Collier, who were discovered dead in their home in 1947 under a enormous pile of things they had accumulated over many, many years. The first brother to be discovered was Homer Collier, and it was suspected that his brother Langley had murdered him. A uh, police manhunt was uh, initiated only for Langley to be discovered a few days later in the same room, just 10 feet away, under another pile of, uh, of belongings. It was a nationally infamous story because of the fact that it wasn't really something that people had seen before. And it kind of goes to show that what we call hoarding now is a disease of modernity, that it's enabled by the social conditions of the 20th century and onward that allows people to accumulate uh, so many possessions and to, to hold on to them for so long. I think it's interesting that, you know, it's not just a psychological condition hoarding, it's also a social condition and a cultural condition. So it's my perception as an American and having traveled other places that it seems that the the prevalence of hoarding, oh, I don't know, it seems like American condition. And that may be a lazy observation or comment, but it's what I've personally seen having traveled to Costa Rica. There aren't rooms filled with stuff. And in many cultures in Europe and other places I've traveled, generally folks go to a market daily or weekly and get what they need. And in, in more impoverished areas, it is not uncommon to electronically pay for a daily ration of toothpaste rather than buying a whole tube. And again, my perception without a ton of research is that this happens more here where when we jump into a hoarding site for a variety of reasons, and we'll get into that, but you know, there could be a cases of unopened things from Costco, right? And so when you have a normal retail shopping behavior where folks get a case of something versus, you know, six pack, 24 pack of something. Now it's a case of something, right? And so, um, yeah, economy of scale. Yeah. The more you buy, the more you save kind of thing. But at some point, you know, when you think one case of water is really not enough and it doesn't go bad, then you get two cases and, oh, what if the power goes out and we don't have water and to get three cases. So we're going to hoarding sites where we go into a room, there, there could be 10 cases of water stacked one upon the other. And and you can tell how long they've kind of been there because the plastic has been compromised and and the water looks a little bit cloudier than it should. It just seems that it happens here more because I just think more is available to us. And shopping in America seems to be more of a pastime um, than it is in other countries. Costco used to be a business wholesale um, channel for, for businesses who, who needed a case of something, but who, if you're brave enough to go to a Costco on a Saturday morning, God bless you. Um, you're fighting tooth and nail. Like things are never going to be replenished. It's just the urgency and the amount of stuff that people put in their cart, um, is, is shocking. So don't, don't ever go to a Costco on a Saturday morning for a bunch of bananas. Please don't do yourself the favor. Go to your local market. I remember going to get toilet paper during COVID and coming home and felt like I just like I brought like a carcass home for the family to eat, like just slapping it on the table. Like I provided for all of you. <laughs> it, it's cause and effect, right? So if one person does it, mm, maybe dysfunction Two, maybe it's a community dysfunction uh, based on geography or societal pressures in that community. However, this happened across America systemically. So, so, so then we have to go upstream a bit, meaning it's normal 
This is normal American behavior. Um, and I think what is common through all Americans is this idea that, I'll say it, that we're almost entitled to win. We're almost entitled to be the best. We're almost entitled to be number one, have the most, be the wealthiest. And in a sense, that entitlement causes us almost to be addicted to convenience. If I can't get something right now, I, as an American, feel entitled that I should be. Why am I waiting for something? Three in line at the grocery store. What? I mean, now there's five. Now I'm suddenly irritated. <clears throat> I'm only irritated because my expectation is to get served immediately and not only shop quickly, but then to check out quickly all in the span of, of minutes. It, it is super interesting that because we're uh, addicted to convenience, we then become fearful of the possibility that we can't get what we want when we want it. So if we go to a store and we see nothing on the shelf, by God, the next store we see three or 10 of something, we might want to put it in the garage because I want it now. And so I'm going to use the word I because I've experienced that. I have felt that. Uh, and, and it came, you know, COVID was an interesting experiment where we got exposed to really what the society looks like when we run out of something. It's close to an apocalyptic, dystopian glimpse at what society could back could be like if we didn't have all the conveniences that we normally have. Well, travel can also give you that glimpse, right? When you go to a, a smaller country that has less resources, you realize, oh, okay, that could take a half an hour to get something. I may have to walk to a market, pick up a couple things, make whatever I can, and then and then come back home. And that and that's not minutes, right? That that could be an hour, um, because that's that's we're so fast here. You literally can go on Amazon in the morning, and then something gets there by the afternoon, e even if you don't want that. S someone. Someone's hustling to get that to you without even being asked to, right? I don't know that many people that need something in four hours. I was talking about this episode the other day with my grandfather, and he actually made the point that humans aren't the uh, only ones who hoard, that you see animals accumulating large amounts of food, probably more than they would be capable of ever eating. I mean, squirrels are famous for filling you know, their little hidey holes with hundreds of hundreds of nuts and acorns. And I think there is something about the instinct to just accumulate and accumulate these uh, valuable items, which kind of gets people in their instincts. I mean, it's the same as anytime something bad happens on the news or there's some sort of emergency and everybody runs to the store to buy toilet paper. It's uh, almost like reason is being overridden by this 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 fear of not having enough and the desire to start storing and stashing uh, these things that you think you may need soon. I was working at a grocery chain during the COVID pandemic, and uh, I got to see some of the worst of people coming in, grabbing the toilet paper. We had to institute a limit one pack per customer type thing, and everyone would try to circumvent those, and they're all pissed about it as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. When doing research for this episode, something I, I read is that hoarders accumulate things for the same reasons as everybody else. They don't have a fundamentally different attitude towards material possessions. They just have an exaggerated version of the same behavior that, you know, many other people exhibit. So it's just the more extreme version of the mindset that, that you're describing. When you look at um, bulimia, the need to binge, then purge is an interesting, almost tributary river of a main river, but you, you want to tie that back into the same, the same philosophy of, of needing more, but, but not wanting the effects. Right. And so that, that leads me to a story in, in hoarding. I mean, we, the story, classic story in hoarding is that, Hey, I had a client and she was an accountant and her house is really tidy. She's alone and she's fit everything seems normal. And then you ask her, what can we help you with? And she shows you one room top to ceiling of completely clean and empty pizza boxes, all arranged systematically from the same 
restaurant. They're exactly the same size, positioned the exact same way. Kind of like a spreadsheet. They're all lined up and you're thinking, okay, that's going to take 10 minutes to clean up. And then the real issue is the next room where there's bags of vomit and each bag is one pizza that she's consumed and her net balance sheet is zero because whatever she's consumed that she didn't want to consume, but had the need to consume or desire to consume has now been erased. The issue is she still had the need to fill a hole. She still needed to order a whole pizza, consume it immediately, and then through guilt or shame or both needed to purge that whole pizza into a clear bag where she saw a net sum zero. And then by true accounting, have visual evidence by keeping those plastic bags and seeing it check against another room of empty boxes. Or this feeling of lack, feeling of incompleteness, right? So when we go to a hoarding site, I, I quickly learned never to label anything. To say honestly that whatever I'm seeing around me was chosen and placed where it is for whatever reason. And I never make the assumption that I can throw anything away, even though it appears to me that it's junk, a discarded item, a food container, gross filth. We always ask for permission as to what are we keeping and what are we discarding um, and then, and then begin the conversation that way. You cannot make assumptions on what, what is valuable psychologically to somebody uh, versus materially, right? If, if folks are holding on to things that are monetarily have no value, but they have a longstanding relationship to that item, um, then it does have value to the individual that we're working with. Something else I learned about hoarders is they tend to perceive every one of their possessions as unique. And what that means is that if they have 10 blenders in their kitchen, a rational person would just say, get rid of uh, nine of them. You only need one blender. But for them, each blender is special and important. And that's also one of the main reasons they do not like people even to rearrange their things without getting rid of it is because let's say they have two blenders that are identical. Maybe they put one on one side of the room, one on the other. They don't want to get those identical blenders confused because to them they are distinct and they have separate values. So if somebody starts rearranging them or they put all the blenders in, in one box or something, now they, they can't tell which is which and that's upsetting to them because in their mind, every, every possession they own is unique and valuable in its own specific way. A lot of times we see hoarding as a direct result of some kind of trauma. There's an event, usually a, a lifelong loved one, a partner dies, and now that person is alone. And every time, let's say, those two people in a couple ordered takeout, it was a joyous experience. Oh, we're having, you know, Chinese takeout or we're having pizza or whatever. What's fun every Friday? Whatever their routine was, it was a treat. So now this person's alone and they're ordering takeout, trying to reminisce and reenact the moment where they weren't alone. And what happens is they want evidence that it still happened. So they'll actually keep the container to remind them that it did happen, it will continue to happen, and the memory's still there, even with things that you throw away. You could absolutely re-traumatize by making a simple assumption, gosh, there's rotting food in that container. I'm now going to help you, all good intent, and throw away all of that. Which you still can, but you have to check in, have an agreement, make sure that you're on the same page, and get permission to do that. The, the biggest thing I always tell people is that we can do any work. The biggest um, hurdle in the work is consent. An explicit agreement to move forward in a personal space. We, we call these spaces, actually, we call them sanctuaries. Um, so that, that's something we have to keep mindful of. And related to what you were saying, it can make certain jobs rather difficult if the, um, the owner of those items is watching every single item that you do take away. It can extend a job from a simple day to a week long because as you dig up these items, they are reliving these memories because every single item they own has a specific memory attached to it. So as you're going through these layers, you're just seeing as the bags are filling up, it's it's taking a mental toll on them. It's it's beating them down, having to 
relive all these memories. And it should. I think it's really important that they feel that anxiety when things are getting taken out and, and even thrown away. Um, because the the easier it is for you to just purge everything and throw everything away, the more likely you are to rehoard the house and faster and worse. Um, so apparently it's it's good for them to feel that anxiety. An article I read, it compared, you know, a person who with good intentions perhaps goes into their relative's house and throws out their entire hoard. It's like going into an alcoholic's house and pouring all their bottles down the sink. They're just going to go get another bottle as soon as they realize that their stash has been uh, dumped. And a hoarder, it's, it's, it, is, it is an addiction. It's an addictive behavior. So to remove the items without addressing the cause of why they accumulated those things, it'll take them maybe a couple months to fill the house up again, but they will do it, you know? So my son, who has been my best buddy since he was born, I mean, kid looked like me right when he came out of the womb. And uh, we really had, a, we really have had a very strong connection, right? And um, a great male father son bond. It's it's beautiful. So having gone through divorce, um, my son has had to share spaces: one room in his mother's house, and 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 one room in my house. So his room, to me, is his sanctuary. It is his place of hopes, dreams where he does his homework, where he gets its rest, the, the place of tranquility, hopefully, the place where he can you know, sequester himself. And I really have treated that room as a sanctuary, right? And so when my wife said, hey, your son's been in college for two years, he's not really coming back here. And he hasn't on any of his breaks. He's got his sister... And his friends are really close to his mom's house, and he tends to go there if he's just here for a few days or a week. It is less convenient to go back and forth. He wants to have his stuff in one place, closest to his friends, etc. Totally makes sense logically. But so here's a room that really has collected dust for two years with all his memorabilia, with football and wrestling and track, everywhere where he's left it. No one goes into the room. No one spends time in there. And it is almost like a little mausoleum as if the poor guy died. But he's living well and thriving. And this is his stuff. So when my wife, Nikki, asked me to, hey, let's let's make that room available for guests who, who maybe don't want to be surrounded by football, wrestling, and track memorabilia. And quite honestly, smells a little sweaty, like, like, a, like a locker room. Um, so... I had a really, really tough time with that, right? I, I said, okay, okay, okay. I will I will get my head around that. My first intent was to do it alone and not re-traumatize my son. And I thought, well, that's still cause and effect, right? He comes to an empty room, it's still empty. My second approach was to get him involved and say, listen, I'd like to spend a day with you here in collecting things for donations, a charity, for archiving memorabilia that you want to keep forever and then things that just don't, you know, that I can just donate um, or, or even discard, right? So archive, uh, charity, and 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 just, and that's how we really talk to clients too. It's really with explicit permission of, hey, let's do this together. Let's pre-select your items. Know that some things are going to be repurposed and go to a good home. Some some things you're going to keep for heirloom and, and for family. And then some things, hey, it's just broken. It's just worn out. Let's let's uh, let's get that to the landfill, and dispose of properly. And so we spent the day together looking through his things and coming to the agreement that this is a new time for him. That he's moving on to the next stages of his life, and it allowed me to actually grieve. I I know it sounds crazy, but to have a moment, explain to him that it's very tough for me. I don't know what he was feeling and give, give a window to kind of feel all that stuff versus just denying it and running through it and ripping off the bandaid. Cause really the first approach was, all right, I'll do it. He won't have to feel all that and I'll just put it all in a bag and it'll be done. Um, and then I gave it some more thought and, and that's the same thought. And, and I've learned that from, for help from helping clients is really, you can <laughs> Just because you see the quickest way to do something doesn't mean it's the best way, right? And to take a minute and understand, okay, what does this stuff really mean? 
Uh, and if it means something, let's, let's, let's hold that space. Right. And so that's, that's what we did. And it was the most effective. I still see a room that's completely emptied and my boy's gone, but at least we've had closure on that and an understanding and I can still feel those things, but then the agreement helps me process it. Right. And it must be much, much, much harder for someone who's actually living on top of their stuff and they haven't processed the grieving of the event or events that led them up to that stage. There's usually a demarcation where God, I saw, I saw Susie 10 years ago and this house was dialed in and spotless. She never had a thing out of place. And then you go in there and it's four feet off the ground with stuff like what has happened. And that's what we try to untangle a little bit so we don't get, you know, recidivism in a sense on, on hoarding where they, yeah, they go right back to the same old behaviors and they have to call us back in two years. Right. So that's just a personal thing that I'm sure every parent out there when they're sending their kid off to college and especially then a lot of us have two homes for kids because you know, kids experience the the trauma of divorce. Um, and what does that really mean to the child and what's it mean to the parent uh, on both sides? And so it's, it's the understanding that helps us get through it. Uh, so my grandmother used to go to the thrift store every single day, just about every single day. Uh, it was just part of her little daily routine and she would pick something up almost every visit. Um, and the issue that she had was she had a really tiny one bedroom apartment and she thought, just because something was old, it was worth money. Um, and she thought that the longer she kept it and kept it in good condition, uh, the, the more the value would go up. She was pretty upset when we finally went to have things appraised and something she thought was damn near priceless was $5. Um, she was pretty much in denial about it and thought that they were just trying to get her to sell it to them for $5 so they could go make a fortune off of her. Um, so that was a really awkward ride home but <laughs> um but yeah i mean people think just because it's old it's worth something and that is certainly not the case it's so indiscriminate right and, and people say that all the time is like how much is this worth well it's worth what the market will bear we have done hoarding where we like oh my gosh there are cases of baseball cards and it's like a thousand of the same guy i've never heard of for a team that isn't very well known so you're thinking okay the intent there was to collect and maybe make money, but... That just reminds me of uh, T.Y. Beanie Babies from the 90s. People thought those were going to be like the next fucking big... The Princess Diana one. Oh my God, everybody was like, if you get this, it's going to pay for your college education. Like Everybody was obsessed with this. I remember even seeing the, the couple that divorced and they were in court splitting up their Beanie Babies together on the floor like it was the nuttiest shit I've ever seen in my life. There's often a... a misconception that that hoarders are are lazy people or slobbish people when often they tend to have a perfectionist mindset they're afraid of throwing away something that's valuable because they're they're afraid to make that mistake and they often they they work quite hard at accumulating things that they genuinely believe are valuable so to them it's almost like a a job and uh, they often have a poor level of insight into the true value of things or what their situation is really is. I mean, to everybody else, it's so obvious that uh, these things are not valuable, that it's dangerous to live this way. But in their mind, they're not saying, oh, I don't feel like cleaning today. You know, screw it. I'm just going to sit in, in this garbage because I don't care. In their mind, it's it's valuable. The items are valuable and they are doing something which is worthwhile and they aren't lazy or slovenly people at all. So in a hoarding home, <laughs> If someone determines that their stuff is way valuable and treasure, then that they're their own market, right? They've now determined the value of their stuff. I mean, I've I'm sure you guys have been asked to do ridiculous things, um, or requested uh, ridiculous things, and a lot of times when they do this, I kind of like to repeat it back to them so they can hear me saying it, uh, and it, it it still doesn't work. Um, there was one lady that had me bag up the dirt that was on her floor, bag it in a Ziploc bag and give it to her. I repeated it back to her. I said, you want me to scoop up the dirt from the floor and bag it up so that you can keep it? Yes, that's what I want. And she obviously super defensive over it. A lot of people, if they don't have the right support going through the, a cleanup, they start to resent you and they start to blame you. And that's just something that 
we just I think we're used to at this point. There's almost a step process. You get the first phone call and realize sometimes when they call us, there's a lot of hangups. Sometimes it's scammers. Sometimes it's spam. Sometimes it's a hoarder who's just afraid to speak. They've hurt themselves on their trash. They've gotten to a point where they just can't do it anymore. They wake up in the morning and go, God, I just want to walk to the front door. Something has gotten to the point where they need to pick up the phone. And sometimes that's age, just age. They've broken down or they've been compelled by a neighbor or a family member or a best friend. We need to make this call. Now it's not safe. And so when they call you, they're often nervous. They're shy. They're embarrassed. They're, they become defensive. Oh, it's not that bad. That is code for it's going to be the worst thing you've seen in a while. When someone says there's not that much, it's not that bad, you already know they're they're compensating for something that is pretty bad. And I don't want to say bad, that it's that that it's inundated, that it's complex, that it's complicated, and that's hard for them to let go, right? I know it's easier to say bad, but that's really what I mean. Uh, no shortcuts. But so when someone speaks to you for the first time, you you gotta slow down with them. You gotta slow down. Thank you for calling me. What has compelled you to call me today? What is going on? How can I help? And to further the trust and agreement, at some point, you have to connect with them and empathize enough for them to let you in their home. And it certainly is with an entourage of people. Even though you want as many of your crew and team to come with you to just start to understand what, what, what work is involved, they're allowing you into their space. And they want it to be very discreet. And so when you do that, the questions that you ask are really, what are we going to be allowed to do and how do we do the work? Uh, and that agreement's always repeated. So what's your goal? Well, I need to just organize this house. Got it. Did you want to start on one room? Is it a garage? I mean, where do you want to start? And then where do you see things going? Because the best way to organize is to actually have things leave your home. Are there things that other families would enjoy using that maybe you have four and five and six of that other families can then be you know, benefiting from using the things that you've purchased? Are there things that you'd like to donate to a church or an organization that they can you know, sell and, and, and get donations from? Are there things that are just broken that we need to now separate? Are there things that we can recycle or the things that we can throw away? And are there true pieces of memorabilia that we can clean up and organize and archive for you? Because when you show up and you see the work that's got to be done, if it were your home, you can't show up with six people and say, let's go to work. Because that person will shut down on you very, very quickly. I think you have to consider too that probably... 75% of the time, um, they're not coming to us because they just decided they want to change their way of living. They're doing it because the city's on their ass about their overgrown lawn and garbage in in their front yard and their backyard, or they're having an inspection because they have subsidized housing, or just, you know, they're their landlord or whoever found out that they were uh, that they were hoarding and they need to get it fixed or else they're, they're going to get evicted. Um, so it's really important that we make them very comfortable and we kind of get them a little bit excited about it because, like I said, a lot of the time they're not doing it because they particularly want to, rather they have to. In some cases, too, you've got an intervention of some sort. And I don't mean a, you know, 10 family members coming through and go, we got to do this. That That happens, but pretty rarely. The intervention comes to play when, let's say, the older aunt with their nieces and nephews will call and say, ah, they took my aunt or grandmother or whatever older um, family member. They took them to the hospital. And when I went to their house, oh, my God. And I'll say, okay, so where are they now? They're still in the hospital. What has happened to them? They might be there for a few days or a week. I said, okay, great. So what's your goal? I want them to come back to a nice, tidy, healthy house. Okay. Do we have their permission to do anything in that house? And if you're not getting a clear answer as to they have a power of attorney or they have had a conversation, an explicit one, just know that the work that even if you've been given authorization to help um, clean this home out with a family member, even if they have a power of attorney, just know that that when that person returns to their house and it's clean, neat, and tidy, their response is going to be, where's all my stuff? 
And we have seen firsthand where you've got complete legal permission to do everything. You do such a great job and it's clean and you would live there yourself. And that's the intent that when that family member comes back, they break down mentally and physically and they go right back to the hospital with an ailment that is tied to the trauma that they're receiving. So it, it, it's tough because you're like, I got a green light. Let's do it. Let's do the good thing. And then realize, well, the person living there hasn't really, they're not aware. They're not aware enough. Or they haven't given consent or, or whatever in situations where they don't return home. Great. Do the best job in, in trying to realize what items they'd want to keep in archive with that other family member, because some people don't have the time to sort with you, right? And so just just realize it's still the same effect whether you're given legal permission to do something or not. You're, you, you've got to keep the person who's involved the most in mind when you're, when you're doing these things or else you're going to hurt them. Look, when you're alone and you're alone in your home and don't go outside, you know, we, we often find a hobby room. And I'll say that word hobby room because, you know, there's family involved. And so if there's 14 computer screens up and some of them have porn still on them, you're like, well, the hobby room in this case was a self-sex pleasure room, whatever. The hobby room could also be a drug room where there's just a lot of um, paraphernalia for, you know, occasional weed, but also crack and other things too. It's, you don't know maybe what their drug of preference is. There's just a lot of variety of things. And that room is a probably a self-medication room or, and, or there's a lot of alcohol related things in there too. So that room is now a place of, Hey, what am I going to do for eight hours today? Well, meth and porn go hand in hand. Yeah. Right. So, and, and some of it is craft, right? And we see that too, where there's like 14 rooms of craft. Like I'm sewing here, I'm doing beads over here. Uh, I've got a really big uh, book collection, but yeah, Holly's right. Unfortunately, the one that sticks to my mind is, is a gentleman who is probably, let's see, he was a pretty esteemed pilot. I don't want to identify him clearly, so I'm not going to give you too many markers as to who it might be, but a successful pilot during the Vietnam War. Okay. And according to his family, he was part of a pretty affluent family from the South. So, I mean, affluent like servants and stuff, right? So here's this guy going to the, uh, you know, Air Force Academy and smart. He's an engineer and he's a successful pilot. And then he comes into civilian life and has, has a great clearance. And look, he's done well for himself. So by the time we see him, what does that put him in his 70s, I think, right? M- mid 70s. So by the time we see him, he's probably, I don't know, 120 pounds. He's got, you know, a nice shirt on, buttoned down, and a vest, and a jacket. He looks like he's a clockmaker. He's so little and kind of frail and um, soft-spoken. We're led into his house, and it's, it's a really big, nice house in the hills, and all his family members have left him. Then you're starting to see why. There are bottles, like big, hard liquor bottles everywhere, just on every piece of flooring and dog feces. So clearly his dog's his best friend and the dog does whatever it wants. And he's, he's drinking himself probably close to death. So that's going on, but then you enter into one room and my goodness, um, the debauchery in that room for someone who just looks so like a Keebler elf, just proper with his little tweed vest and his, his wool coat and, fancy shoes and all that. And you go in this room and he gives you the tour of his house. And there's so much photographic porn strewn out on a king size bed and life size, really expensive sex sex dolls, dolls. but yeah, they're malleable and they're, they've got weight to them and they're fleshy. And I guess that's okay, but they're torn apart And they've got bite marks in them and the vagina has just really been torn apart. And there's just violence on this thing because it's made of a kind of a polypropylene or something. It's kind of spongy. And he just walks you through that room like it's a Sunday. Like, hey, we're going to have tea after I give you the tour of the house kind of bit. And you're like, how is this so normal? 
there is semen oozing from the vagina still on this doll. And you're thinking, how does it become this normal or this gentle man who's got all kinds of military awards and like bronze star this and all, all the success who have, who's now lives alone in this gorgeous house that was gorgeous, no longer is with no family at this point. Like, how did he get here? And how is it, how can he just walk two people in his home, a male and a female? And just so, yeah, we need to do a little cleaning in this room and a little cleaning in this room. Like, my goodness, he's not even aware of everything we're, we're laying our eyes on. So when we talk about pornography and, and dildos and things, it sometimes gets to a fetish stage of like, you know, it's like a leaving Las Vegas scene where he doesn't have someone, he has this, 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 this toy he's using and tearing apart and, and fetishizing whatever he's fetishizing with it in kind of a violent manner. It's, it is shocking. Yeah. And there's that trademark lack of insight. They call it a person who was clearly not unintelligent, not uh, incapable of being polite and uh, friendly and obeying social conventions, but who just has this enormous blind spot into their own behavior. Yeah, when I said meth and porn go hand in hand, I meant it. Um, I did a cleaning for a meth lab that was in a really fancy high-end apartment downtown. It was a big high-rise building. And the guy was cooking meth in his kitchen, but he was also shooting porn. And the entire house was covered in cinnamon-flavored lube. It smelled like cinnamon. Everything was slippery. There was so much of it that we had to pull the floors and it was under the floorboards. That's how bad it was. He had, oh God. Okay. You know, those, uh, those Hawaiian punch bottles, those big ones you get from like Costco. All right. He had two of those bottles. One was filled to the top with cum and the other one he was just starting to work on, but you could see the layers in the bottle uh of you know where it was a little bit older where it was a little bit newer there were just layers in it and then he started working on the other one not your grandpa's sea monkeys yeah i took a picture of that too i have <laughs> i saved i had to save that i had to document that um he, he had all kinds of dildos everywhere he had one of those machines um i don't know if you've ever seen the movie bruno but it's they they get on like this uh extra cycle thing and this thing just like comes out and it has like a dildo attached to it so yeah <laughs> he had one of those he had one of those but it wasn't like a, it wasn't like the extra cycle it was like it had its own pressurized thing hooked up to it so it just made the, the stabbing motion <laughs> if you will i know you're hearing us kind of nervously laughed and that's exactly what it is it's nervous laughter because part of us are like a little scared as to what are people doing? And I'm in their space. And I mean, what are the ghosts in this room kind of thing? Like what, what memories are lurking around you that you just feel? It's funny that you say that because that exact job, um, he took off and the police couldn't find him. He was on the run, had a warrant out. Um, while we were cleaning, he came up to his apartment, uh, and I thought one of my coworkers was behind me. I turned around and looked. Nobody was there. Uh, and then I walked over. And there was an empty bottle of vodka. I'm like, what the hell is this? And it wasn't from any of my guys. It turned out while we were cleaning, this guy came back to his apartment and was standing right behind me and crept back out quietly. I had no idea he was standing behind me. Um, within 10 minutes or so, the whole building was surrounded by police. And he got away again. <laughs> Downtown again. Very nice apartment. Probably eight or 9,000 a month, to be honest, a pretty successful rapper wants us to come clean a bathroom. And the bathroom is somewhere where he let his dog, if he didn't have quote unquote time to take the dog out, the dog would just go in the bathroom. And so he just called to clean it up. And so he called us, paid us in cash. And then it was like an introduction. It's like the next three days, like, Oh, can you do it again? Yes, we can. Same thing. Cash in hundreds. The next time is like, oh, can you do the rest of the house? Sure. Which included his bedroom. And then on his dresser, there were, I don't know, a thousand one hundred dollar bills just kind of strewn about. Took a picture of all that just to make sure. But he was still in the house, which was we were thankful with that much cash just lying around. The fourth time he had a friend over, which wasn't his wife, 
because we spoke to his wife the first time. And uh, the friend was just sitting in the living room as we were cleaning. And then the friend went into his bedroom and they left the door open and we were hearing everything. So what turned out to be a cleaning turned out to be kind of a fetish thing. And it, it we obviously stopped doing that kind of work for him because we understood where it probably was going to go into a non, not a safe space. Sometimes you just don't feel safe in an environment w- when the client's still there. That reminds me of um, this huge historic building downtown. It used to be a beautiful hotel and now is low income housing. This particular place has the highest saturated amount of sex offenders in our entire county. Um, so it was it was scary, you know, being in a room where somebody can just come in and close you in there and now you're cornered. Um, so, at, you know, being being a female, um, I never really liked going there unless I had uh, a male coworker with me. People are on drugs there. People are high. They're not knowing what they're doing. One of the last times I was there, I found somebody overdosed behind the dumpster. Um, so it's it's a pretty pretty nasty place, uh, but we I f- end up finding myself there a couple times a year or so. <laughs> yeah, and the, and and you know the clients need us, right? I mean, if it's low income housing, where are they coming from? They're either coming up or down. So if they're coming up, that means they're coming off off the street. If they're coming down from some, they're coming from an apartment into a transition place. If they're coming off the street, they bring whatever is with them from the street, meaning all the things in nature. If they're hanging on the woods, they can bring ticks and bed bugs and, you know, other things that feed off of food and so forth. So rodentia, roaches, bed bugs. Yeah. No matter how many times you clean, you get rooms where there isn't one bed bug. There's like 10,000 of them. It's not an exaggeration. And then you're seeing this little war between roaches and bed bugs. It's like, who's going to win because the roaches like the blood off the, off the bed bug and the bed bugs are pretty fierce themselves and will feed off of anything. So it's this weird. <laughs> um, Legendary battle. Yeah. Like Lilliputian kind of, you know, you're a giant and you're watching this giant army of, of one species going after another. It's just crazy. And it's 80 square feet. And you're like, what the hell's going on in here? Um, and this person, that's just a Friday. That's where they live. One of the funniest memories I have of Renee, um, we were both cleaning separate rooms at this historical building. Places loaded with cockroaches, loaded with bed bugs. And, I'm doing content cleaning, so I'm outside the room and Renee's inside the room. So Renee is pulling stuff out of the room and staging it in another spot for me to clean. And as he does this, it just becomes less and less things in the room. So it's an empty room that had a fire escape. So I would stage things on the fire escape, not knowing that they had critters on the things and it was dropping to the floors below to, to the sidewalk people from the essentially sidewalk were looking people are walking at- by going it's raining cockroaches off of that thing and like what the hell's going on and i and you're not thinking you're like how much we we have 80 square feet it's impossible and it's chock a block full it's everyone's it's their it's everything they own in that little space so you're like okay i need to clean everything i can't do that in this space, because as soon as you clean something, it's be dirty again, right? So you got to clean it, bring it to a cleaner space, clean it more thoroughly. And in that time, well, yeah, there's just errant roaches hanging on for their dear lives until they're like, oh, we're free. Let's go hop in that tree or the person down below. Well, by the last item there was for you to move out. Once you moved it, they're like, where the hell are we going to go now? Oh, we'll go to you. We'll go right to your legs. So what happened was they all just came after Renee and started trying to climb up his legs. Oh, dude, it was like... <laughs> so he comes running in the room, try, patting his suit down, freaking out, and he just send, says under his breath, they overrun me. Like, not <laughs> not to me, like to himself, like, holy shit, they overrun me. They took me over. <laughs> <laughs> I've, never, I've never seen you that... Uh, I was losing the war. Yeah, you were definitely losing. They were climbing up your legs. They were <laughs> yeah, and guys, we're wearing go. we're wearing full suits, but then yeah, we've got chemicals, man. I mean, we're, we're killing a lot of viruses and bacteria. We got some pretty heavy duty shit, right? So, 
they, they, they just, they flip you off, man. You're, you're, you're hitting them with whatever you got. And they're like, that's all you got, motherfucker. So we've lived with the dude that's been living with us. We can handle whatever he's got. We certainly can bring on, you know, and take whatever you got. And seriously, it, Holly's right. When you take things out of a room, they're survivalists. They've gone through the whole evolutionary process of outliving us. They've gone through the ice age, man. They figured out a rock to live under until it got warmer. So they sure as shit can figure you out. So you're exiting and yeah, there's some casualty losses through that process, but the horde, the horde is, is huddled behind that last piece of furniture. Oh yeah, they are like the freaking freaking sinking of the Titanic. They're on that last piece of debris holding on for dear life. And when you move that piece, when you move that fridge, there's nowhere to go except up Renee's legs. Oh, dude, no, you move that, and it's like the walls moving, and you're like, "Oh my god!" And now they're freaking out because it's like, "Oh shit, you're taking our last bastion of hope. You're taking our last buoy. It's it's to the abyss we go," and they know it. If anybody's wondering what this looks like, go to our TikTok, which is America's Finest CSC. And one of our first videos is actually from the place that we're talking about. You'll see the cockroaches. It's probably one of my first uploads on, on TikTok. Uh, and there's also um, some bed bugs that were, were not even the worst that we saw there. <clears throat> it's a kind of uh, low-income housing where you're told not to touch anything. And that's not figurative. It's literal. So they're lovely people who manage the place. And when they give you that first tour and they see you, I don't know, casually leaning on a wall, they're like, don't do that. I'm sorry. What? Breathe? No, 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 no. You can breathe. Don't lean on that wall. What are you talking about? <clears throat> you want to take bed bugs home? Lean on the wall. I don't want to take bed bugs home. Okay, fine. We're going to get off the wall. I have nightmares every time I go there. I have bed bug nightmares. And it's usually the same nightmare. It's usually I'm looking at the ceiling and the ceiling is just filling with more and more and more of them. And they're all just falling down on me. It's always the same dream. Well, when you see the occupant of the 80 square foot room, and he has, he looks like he's got measles, right? So he comes out in whatever he's wearing. Yeah, if he's wearing white, it's no longer white. It's yellow and brown. And then the skin that he's showing is uh, almost every square inch has a, has a bite on it. Like he's living, I don't know, in the Amazon somewhere getting eaten by mosquitoes, right? But that's not the case. He's literally getting eaten by roaches and bed bugs. Probably the last room that we ever did there. Um, that came out and he was wearing a yellow shirt and shorts and he had just bed bugs crawling all over him. It looked like you're right. It looked like he had chicken pox cause he just had bites all over him. Like he was just unaware that there was just a, a colony of bed bugs living on his person. <laughs> so every floor had at least one prostitute and that's not just a guess. <clears throat> the door is always left cracked open on that room and the person's usually prone in their bed and you just walk in the hallway and you just kind of see a glimpse of that in varying states of dress or undress. Every floor has one of those, sometimes two. And then every floor has a distributor of some kind, whatever your medical preference is, self-medication preference, that person's selling that. And we started to know the cycles of this low income housing, um, complex, let's call it. I think you know what job I'm talking about here, but do you remember the really, really big whole, how many nine day hoard? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder sometimes how many piss bottles were in that house. So many bottles just mixed with trash um, that we needed pitchforks to loosen everything up. So let's give you an idea of that, right? <clears throat> it's a bank owned property. The neighbors are really curious about the property. Like, what are you guys doing there? What happened? Well, all I can tell you is that someone has passed away and the firefighters have come through and when they saw it open the door, because the door couldn't be opened, the gentleman was at the door, meaning he had passed away standing up at the door. So literally the, the, the saw that they used to cut that door open actually cut the dead body that was attached to that door waiting for a food delivery. He just didn't make it. He died at the door. And when that door got opened, it was a solid wall of debris that was six feet high. In other words, the entire frame of the door is filled like an archaeological dig, meaning that 10 years worth of whatever he decided 
to keep. Newspapers, magazines, trash, new deliveries stacked one layer upon the next, like the Grand Canyon of trash. Literally, we found newspapers from the 70s. Just impacted. Impacted, so dense. You're walking on it when it's one foot high, then two, and then three. A urine bottle breaks, now you've added moisture, and you're basically making concrete or paper mache at least. It took us two days just to get into the entryway of that door because it was so dense. We couldn't use, I know this sounds funny, but we use snow shovels when there's loose debris and it's six feet high. This was not loose. A snow shovel was bending or breaking. So we had to use a metal pitchfork just to loosen the debris in order to then remove the debris. The entire first day was just us clearing the hallway. The hallway. Just the hallway. We had nine techs at this job and we're thinking, do we need to go through a window? Do we need to go through the back door? How do we get to the garage? We can't open the garage because there's debris all the way up to the garage and the garage door won't open. We black bag everything so no one, so it's discreet, right? So so when you're pulling things, hand carrying things out of a home, it's black bag, it's discreet. And it goes into an unmarked vehicle. But when you see nine people doing that in suits, your neighbors are like, what is going on in there? We have not seen that person who lives there for 10 years years he has not left his house and to learn that he had no water for several years he didn't throw his trash away either he was so concerned about an agency or another entity looking through his private information so concerned that he wouldn't take his trash out and he wasn't stupid he was a grandmaster of chess he was an engineer he coding. was we found co- a he did coding, coding. So. he had a professional career at, at one point he was he had success he was so successful that we'd find rooms that like when Holly tells you how many bottles of urine there were, well, he would get shipments of water in 16 ounce bottles. He would then fill them, re-put the cap on, stack them, and then palletize them. So there'd be, it was a four bedroom room, a house. And then one room was devoted floor to ceiling of properly stored and stacked urine bottles. Like he wanted to keep record or archive the number of urine bottles he had in that one room. And trust me, the bottom layer of those plastic urine bottles after, I don't know how many years, <laughs> very, very volatile as far as opening up, right? Because it's weight upon weight upon weight. Yeah, I've never had so much urine all over me than yeah. from that job. Cause you have the pitchforks too. And you got, I mean, you can't, this is a job that you gotta, you gotta, jump in and come in hot because if you're if you just sift through stuff slowly we'll never get it done so you know we have the pitchforks and we're just trying to loosen all the debris up and we're poking these bottles with piss in them and they're spraying everywhere so so it's it was it was really hard to avoid those (laughs) there had to have been five thousand piss bottles at least the front door hallway took like like holly said a a couple days just to get to and then the coat closet was the first concern. So an entryway is typically four or five feet, uh, about three feet wide and about four or five feet deep, right? That's kind of what we call an entryway to a, to a basic ranch style home. So we walk in there and clear that hallway. There's a coat closet that says, don't even think about entering. <laughs> don't even think about entering. So we look at the closet door. There are 10 padlocks starting from the top, going down the length of the door with the sign that says, don't even think about entering. Is there a bomb? (laughs) Is it booby trapped? Is there a person in there? We don't open it from the front. We keep continuing to remove debris till we get to the bedroom behind the closet. And we do remove a little bit of the wall to understand what is in that room. Floor to ceiling. Desktop computers. Floor to ceiling. All sealed. All, all, all in that closet, floor to ceiling. Could not get one more in there. Hard drives. Hard drives. And they were all wrapped in foil. It isn't for us to judge. And in fact, you have to do the opposite. The more you bring your world into this world and make your own assumptions into that world, you start to get into trouble. Can I trust the store? It's just a closet. Mm, maybe not. Do you need a bomb sniffing dog? If you got one. We don't make assumptions and we don't make judgments. People collect things for a reason. That's why we ask for a list. I need every single turtle you're going to find. Not a real turtle. 
A ceramic one. Okay. We'll hold on to every ceramic turtle we find. We'll hold on to every eyeglass, all 300 eyeglasses that we find. We will put and seal in a box. 100%. But if you tell us to remove everything we think is junk, it will all go because most of it probably has some gross filth on it, right? So everything we retain has to be sanitized, has to be remediated to the point where we can. And if it can't, we tell you it can't be. And we'll recommend disposal. I have not done as many hordes as, as y'all have. I've probably done about a dozen, I'd say, in the year I've been uh, working with you. But I'd say out of those dozen, probably 10 of them appeared to be severe alcoholics. That's one of the main commonalities that I notice is, uh, like Renee said about the older gentleman, just massive quantities of uh, liquor bottles strewn around where they sleep. So that seems to be a very common denominator. Um, a lot of them are fairly wealthy. I mean, not the ones in public housing especially, but it's sort of a good example of how being poor reigns in your ability to be a hoarder because you're living in close proximity to other people, and if bed bugs are crawling from your room into the room next to, uh, next to you, you're probably going to get evicted or they're going to hit you with a cleaning bill or make you do something about it. But the worst hordes, it's the people who... Uh, who own a home outright, they're probably not even paying the mortgage on it, they may be older, retired, they may have a pension, and they're physically isolated. It may be one person living in a two-story, three- or four-bedroom house with a yard around it, so even if it smells uh, you know, terrible, the neighbors probably won't even notice that anything is amiss. They may say, hey, I, never see a, I never see him around anymore, I never see him come out of his house but they have no idea what's going on in there, which allows it to progress to this very uh, advanced state. And I think there's something interesting about that, how, you know, it's unusual in the world and in history for an older person to be living alone in such a massive space. And it must feel very empty to them. I mean, they, maybe their kids have moved to other states, don't visit a whole lot. Maybe they have a little more money than they even know what to do with. And uh, a lot of them seem to be shopping addicts. I mean, something I notice often is things which are still in the packaging, clothes which are still in plastic bags, electronics which are still in the plastic uh, clamshell container. And it seems that for many of them, buying things and filling up this big empty space, maybe it's a way to, uh, you know, feel a little less isolated and a little less like you're living in a, a warehouse kind of or an empty warehouse I suppose they'd rather live in more of like a full warehouse type situation it's surprising the number of hordes that we've gone to where it isn't just um, someone less well off where it is someone who is very successful in the past and you know they have degrees they have certifications they have acknowledgments of achievement and it's just that they've gotten to a point where there's nobody else checking in on them. There's no family left, or if they did have kids, they've moved away. And just without that contact, they've, they've started to descend into habits. And it's, it's surprising how often we'll, we'll go to a horde. It's a really nice house. And it's just because this one person doesn't have anyone else left in their life. And the only thing left for them is uh, collecting essentially not not friends but items one thing that i see that most of our clients have in common is there is severe depression um, because they make their world so small uh, and they don't let anybody in and i can't imagine being so uncomfortable with my own home and not being able to let anybody in because of because of shame so i think that really really darkens things for them and creates a lot of depression for them. Um, you can hear it in their voice. You can see it in their eyes. Um, something's just, something's missing. Um, and it's obviously from whatever trauma that, you know, whatever event happened in their lives that um, caused them to, and or triggered them to start hoarding. There are times where I definitely... Uh, I am a bit judgmental and a bit frustrated by hoarders, probably because, you know, we live in a place where housing is so expensive. To see, to see a person who has a large house entirely to themselves and then treats it as if it's almost worthless, it's uh, 
it can be frustrating to see that at times because it's like, man, I, w- I would love to have this house. You know, I would love to have a two story house to myself. Um, that's probably worth over a million dollars. And then to treat it like that, it's, you know, and it, it seems uh, very wasteful and it's not intentional, obviously, as, as we've discussed, but it can be hard to see that. It can be frustrating to see that at times for sure. How can a frog sit in boiling water? Well, it doesn't. Right. I mean, it's an old story of a frog sits in a cold pot of water, slowly gets warm and suddenly it's too hot to get out. So it, things don't happen overnight. So when you look at somebody in the final stages of where they're at, well, I mean, what have they been through to get there? And if you're going to ignore all that and hop, skip them and hold them accountable or judge them for where they're at now, well, you're just not acknowledging where they've been. So there's a lack of understanding there. It's not as if they are having a great time in there, of course. But on the topic of if uh, you know a person who struggles with hoarding or if you yourself struggle with it, it's easier to start with a small section than to address the entire problem at once. People who hoard often have some kind of issue with executive functioning, with making decisions. They often have uh, similar behaviors as people with For example, attention deficit disorder where decision-making can be overwhelming to them. And the way that hoarding is treated when they have the opportunity to uh, receive therapy is to define a set of rules they can follow to decide what to keep, what to acquire, what to get rid of, and make it less of a choice, make it more of a system. I think it's interesting, you know, there was the popularity a couple years ago of that Marie Kondo show where she introduces these rules for deciding how to get rid of uh, your possessions when they're no longer needed. You know, if it doesn't spark joy, if it doesn't spark joy, get rid of it. And obviously many people, even who are not hoarders, they found that helpful because uh, a lot of people have difficulties getting rid of stuff. I mean, something else I learned is the amount of storage space that is uh, being rented has increased quite a lot just in the past 10, 20 years. And people get storage spaces because they have more than they know what to do with, but they can't bring themselves yet to get rid of it. And, you know, most people, their storage spaces, how often do they really go there? I mean, they probably have things in there that they haven't used in five or ten years, but they still just can't quite get themselves to the point where they're ready to dispose of that item. What brings you joy? That, man, that's critical. And it's a mantra, right? Because it's the opposite. I can't get rid of 45 dog bandanas for the last three dogs that have passed away in my life because I just can't do that because I remember them and I honor them and I cherish them. Are those bandanas giving you joy or is it a reminder that they're gone? I think an important thing to bring up too is sometimes people get too attached to you. Um, sometimes you, you can make somebody too comfortable and it's happened to me quite a bit where, um, you know, I'll have a client that's calling me every day, texting me every day, um, asking me for favors and and I, I don't mind. And and that's usually what gets me into the mess to begin with is, is of course I can help this person. Like, why not? It's going to take 10 minutes out of my day, but sometimes that's the only offer that's the only help that they're they've been offered and i think you have to consider that before you get them too comfortable with you (laughs) it's important to set boundaries between you and the client or else you know it could happen that way (laughs) i think you're uh you're right holly and it's important that hoarders feel effective as individuals that they they learn to make those difficult decisions for themselves because if another person makes a decision for them they won't necessarily get better. Well, that's going to do it for this week. If you need more of your America's Finest Fix, find us on Instagram at AF Crime Scene Cleaners. Next week, we're going to tackle how we take care of ourselves mentally as technicians. Thank you all for listening.